Okay, good morning. Welcome again to the second eighth week, and we're going over the deeper things of the Lord beyond the veil. Okay, and so open your Bibles to the Epistle of John. That's first John chapter three. We're gonna start there, but we'll be moving around a little more. Okay, from one chapter to the next chapter. So make sure you have your notepad ready and your highlighter and your pen. Get ready to take some notes. And we're gonna start here. Okay, so in that's in first John chapter three. Again, the Apostle John is bringing to the attention of those on the instruction of his stewardship concerning what the love of God is. Now, the love of God is expressed in according to his likeness. And he goes on and explains us, God is love. Okay, God is, expresses the very virtue which he is. Now, when we express virtue one to another, we're expressing that same likeness. That same likeness is a power of charity. Okay, now, as you look over at the, the picture over here, we can see the transformation is taking place by the power of charity according to his love. So you see, go to the top and you see from glory to glory. We'll be re making references to this as we go on. Okay, and from power to power and from likeness to likeness. Okay, this is the vow which God vowed to himself. And God swore by himself like he swore to Abraham. Okay, that he swore by himself. And when he said this to Abraham, he says that in blessing I will bless you. God also swore to himself according to his wrath that he will not change. I am the Lord, I change not. Now we know that the covenants of the Lord has changed. But regarding his character, his character has never changed. As Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Now the Apostle John, as he brings out here in 1 John chapter 3, he says here, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Okay, we're taking on his likeness, we're taking on that virtue of power, his rewards, which he gives to us, these powers, okay, which change our perception of life. It changes our thinking so that we have the mind of Christ, that we view things in this world and the things that are passing through this dimension according to his perspective. When we view things from his perspective, then we cease to offend him and we cease to offend our brother. That we are keeping in, in rhythm with that commandment, which he says, you shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor on your, as yourself. On this hang all the law and the prophets. He, all the prophets and all things which God initiates he, is sustained according to this rhythm. Loving God he, with all your heart, which is in faith with all your soul, the will to serve, with all your mind, the study of doctrine, and with all your strength, the tokens which he gives to us to sacrifice. The strength of these sacrifices, the bonding of charity, the building of the kingdom, the establishing of his house. From glory to glory, from likeness to likeness. Okay, we see this right here, from glory to glory, from power to power, from likeness to likeness. Okay, a transformation takes place now I'm going to go on this other side here. From the bosom to the bosom. From the bosom to the bosom. Okay, now we go down to the Gospel of John. Keep your finger here okay, on 1 John chapter 3, but go to, first, uh, go to the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 1. Okay, then verse, eight, or verse 18. But he says right here, in the beginning was the Word. Okay, you see what I'm pointing at here? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the Apostle John expounds this uh, more to the church when he talks about there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Okay? So we're going to look over at this. Okay? As concerning the Father, the Son, okay? and, the, uh, and the Holy Ghost. Okay? He talks about that. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The oneness has to do with the dimension in which we exist in. Okay? The dimension we exist in is the Father. Okay? But that which we're being obedient to is a record of His Son. Okay? And, how we're, and how we're exchanging and fellowshipping with Him okay, is by the communion of the Holy Ghost. Okay? We are drinking of the Crystal Sea, okay? which He engrafted within us in the of Pentecost. Okay? We're drinking of Him. This is what Jesus was speaking of. Unless you... Uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So Jesus was speaking in regarding of drinking of the crystal sea, okay, that which is of God himself, okay, pure, 
So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, so unto the pure, all things are pure. Okay, as we partake and drink of him, okay, we continually express him in the same manner. Unto the pure, all things are pure. So as we partake of him, our fellowship with him is in, is in purity. The state of the conscience, okay, being pure, uh, uh, allows the soul to continue to go through a transformation from glory to glory. And I go over here. From glory, from glory to glory, to power to power, from lightness to lightness. <clears throat> so here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So should you be my disciples. So from glory to glory has to do with the transformation. Okay? But your spirit takes from the knowledge to the fruit, from the knowledge to the substance. The, the vehicle is the anointing. Without that anointing, there's no transformation taking place. So now we go back here. Well, first let's go to verse 18. Okay, and that is the Gospel of John, uh, Gospel of John, chapter one, verse verse eighteen, where he talks about these things. Okay, so I'm turning over there right now, keeping my finger here. Okay, in First John, we're going to the Gospel of John. All right, we're going to see it here. No man has seen God at any time, which means you cannot behold His face apart from His knowledge. Okay, but we know. The, by the, the by the gospel history that Moses saw the back parts of God as also Enoch saw the face of God and the apostle of John also viewed it he saw the throne uh, the throne of God and God in his throne and the lamb proceeding out from the throne we see this testimony right there in the book of Revelation if you also read about the testimony of Isaiah where he saw the father and the son and the Holy Ghost which is really amazing <clears> that he testified of these things and the name that was secret at the time which would be the name of our redemption, Jesus Christ. So we see in verse 18, Gospel of John 1, 18, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now we go right back to verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, where all things originated. The plan of God originated before the foundation of the world, so that the things which are shall be, and that which is done is that what shall be done, as, uh, as Solomon in all his wisdom said in the book of Ecclesiastes. And God requires that which is past. Now I'm going to point right back over here. God requires that which is past in his bosom. And he established a testimony memorial of himself. And, 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 and by uh, placing this in the state of our conscience, okay, we're going to see all these things now being fulfilled in this dimension, in the, in the dimension of these waters. We've got the dimension of the fires, the dimension of the waters, because the Apostle Paul also brings us to our attention. Are not all his angels ministering spirits? Okay, and are sent forth to what? To minister to us, because he makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay, God appears to angels as fire, but when he is in a crystal sea, okay, again, there was, there, was no, there was nothing to reflect on okay, until he put a dimension here and created beings to manifest himself to. So the angels, he manifests manifest himself as fire. But when the word became flesh, he, manifest, he manifested himself to mankind, the Adamites in their own form, to communicate them in a language that they could understand. He, the language is the same, but the kingdoms were different. And this is what Jesus began to preach. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, I am a reflection of all things in the bosom of my Father and I'm bringing these things to, to bear upon your mind, to awaken your conscience. So those which are in darkness now see this light. Now after the day of Pentecost, God having grafting within us this power, okay, the fire within the waters, and we're now able to perceive this kingdom and to see the face of God, even in one another. So I go back now to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. Okay, so what, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. This is the righteousness which is born of him within us so that we will not be ashamed. Okay, being not ashamed is that he will reward us with these powers okay, the, uh, has, which has to do with the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Okay, that these powers, these spirits which God is grafting within us is for the purpose of this transformation from glory to glory for his likeness from power to power, for his likeness. He continues to issue these things in part, that we may know him. For we receive in part, and we know in part, but then, upon the arrival, we shall see him face to face. Even upon every cycle of your growth, okay, from little children to young men to fathers, 
where we know him in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, as Paul said, then that which is in part should be done away. So God does what? He gives issues another power so that uh, these cycles will continue unabated. Okay, so he says here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, as, uh, as I'm reflecting back about this manner of love is, that is so profound, that is beyond human comprehension. But this love begins to give us a perception of the length, the depth, the height, and the width of this mystery, the love of God, which passes knowledge, okay, which is beyond human experience. It's beyond the Adamite vocabulary. The vocabulary of sin is, uh, is earthy, but the vocabulary of righteousness is heavenly. We communicate this charity to establish this standard, this scale, okay, which we're identifying with, which all things are measured by, Jesus Christ. So we go to verse 27 of chapter 2. And he says, But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you. Okay, this anointing of fire, which we receive uh, uh, on our conversion, the enlightenment, must bring us into a conversion. Okay, we have to receive a power to express him with. The enlightenment is just to give us the, uh, I guess, the awakening of the conscience so that we can go to the door. The Lord will open that door with grace so that you can go in and experience his presence, that you can sup with him now. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, he says in verse 26 of the previous chapter. To seduce is to put you in that shadow of turning. The challenges that are common to all men is to abandon faith for self-sufficiency, to abandon the covenant okay, for survival okay, of the intellect, for the survival of your own logic. The survival of your own logic is a lie okay, because God is the sustainer of all life. The fallen watchers taught man to, uh, to lean upon the knowledge which they gave so that they, by measuring seasons, okay, sowing and reaping time, digging wells, okay, and <clears throat> resourcing the things which God provide, were provided for them, okay, was, they were fallen watchers were teaching man self-sufficiency, a knowledge okay, which revert to himself, and that was called pride. It was called iniquity. <clears throat> Adamites were being taught these things from the time that they were born. And that's why their imaginations became evil, even from their youth. The testimony which Moses wrote and penned in the book of Genesis was a reflection upon that which Enoch pinned down okay, from, the, uh, from the seventh heaven for our benefit of this last generation, okay, that we're preserving this knowledge to keep us in mind and to keep us in focus of the plan of God, his righteousness. So these things are written to you to concern them that seduce you, okay, which will bring you in, uh, into those of the lower things of self-sufficiency, abandoning the anointing and despising his power and walking contrary to government. The anointing which you have received of him abides in you. Okay, and when I highlight the word anointing here in verse 27 because I'm still talking about the love of God. Okay, these things which were concealed in the bosom of the Father was made known by God when he came in the form of the flesh, that we would have confidence in this record and that God would not leave us without a witness, without these powers, okay, which is evidence and proof of his being and of his direct involvement and his plan which we're we are participating in and that we take joy in to see fulfilled because this is God's joy. But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you and you need not that any man teach you because, because now, having received this instruction, this foundation, <clears throat> your, uh, your eyes are now focused upon him. Okay? Because now the truth gives you eyes to behold the face of Christ with. Okay? That which is now being inscribed within you by this anointing is what we're living by. This is the new covenant he talked about. But this is the covenant that I'll make with him after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in her mind and write them in her hearts, and they shall know me from the least to the greatest, from the least to the greatest. From the letter to the word. From the letter to the word, these things will be inscribed within them and their iniquities okay, I will forgive. Okay, which means okay, the offense will now be removed. I will blot out the offense and the power of that offense, which is in the law, which addresses the moral code. Okay, the law addresses the moral code, okay, which sustains the offense. Okay, but the anointing addresses faith, which removes the offense and produces a substance of his virtue within you, which we live by, 
every word of God. Okay, so this, he goes on here. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things in his truth. So we know what the anointing is. The anointing, which is the spirit, which is the fire, okay, is building upon this knowledge and this foundation to effect change within you from glory to glory. Okay, from glory to glory, from power to power, from lightness to lightness. From the bosom to the bosom. Okay, we are in a journey. We are in a journey within this dimension, from the bosom to the bosom. That's why we are called strangers okay, and sojourners. Okay, and we are called pilgrims. Abraham he was the first to make mention of these things as being strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Why does Abraham say that? Because he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was in this, in this dimension to establish a, uh, a testimony of his own aspiration. And Jesus, when he came down here, was called the man of sorrows, abandoning okay, that same aspiration. Okay, not to establish within, within this dimension, which is going to be dissolved by fire, because, because this dimension was going to be dissolved by fire. Jesus coming into this dimension was going to establish a name in this dimension, not for the praise of man, but for the glory of God. So that's why he's called the man of sorrows. Because when Jesus came into this dimension, he did not pursue the pleasures of all the powers of the imagination of being a God. He came down here with a mission. This mission was to provide a record for faith so that we can enter back into the bosom of the Father according to his lightness, according to his power, according to that glory, from glory to glory. So this is what Paul's talking about. We, and we are changed into his image from glory to glory. The anointing here, it teaches of all things. So I, I might want to underline the word all things. The anointing is teaching you. He's teaching you all things. He's not talking about the technologies of man. He's talking about all things concerning the spiritual things, the gifts, the callings, the graces of God. He, uh, as concerning the government, the truth, and the spirit, the prayer and the preaching, the prophecy. The threefold cord is what the spirit is revealing to us. He, the tether of this mystery. The tether of this mystery is a lifeline into the Father's bosom. Okay, the tether of this mystery is a lifeline back into the Father's bosom. Okay, and Jesus is giving us this tether in himself. Okay, and this tether is what's joining us to him. Because he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. He poured his spirit within us, this fire, within these waters, okay, to purify, to purge, to prepare, to initiate, okay, to consecrate us, and to bring us back to the bosom of the Father. Okay, so that we as children can function according to his likeness. All right, as kings and priests, as we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Okay, so we go back here. Teaches you of all things. We talked about the word all things. If you want to highlight that, put a note on that, you can put spiritual things. Because spiritual things under spiritual things, Paul brings out. But the Spirit has revealed unto us these things. The things which are concealed and hidden within the state of the conscience are now revealed by the Spirit okay, and, man, and uh, is now made manifest to the church, as Paul brings out in Colossians there. But as, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth and is no lie. So I highlight the word truth there. Truth, which is consistent with us character, purpose, and plan. And it is no lie because it doesn't stand in man's record. It stands in God's record. Okay. When truth and mercy meet together, when truth and mercy meet together, it produces an offspring. Okay, because truth springs out of the earth and mercy comes down from above. His peace uh, brings, uh, brings uh, a substance. A, a substance is born by his peace within us so that we are birthed into a new kingdom, as he brings out in chapter 5. Okay, the beloved, now are the sons of God. Okay, and does not yet appear we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, beloved, uh, well, we go back to verse 20, 27 here. And there's no lie, which is the record of man. Anything that, uh, anything that springs of the record of man springs of the soil okay, and works a lie. So every, anything that loveth and maketh a lie, we see in the book of Revelation, cannot enter into the holy city. It cannot enter back into our mother's bosom. Okay, which okay, is, again, the, is a reference point of a throne to begin a new program. Okay, which Enoch says is the tenth week and seventh part. And even as is taught you, you shall abide in him, because God is inscribing within us okay, this new perspective. 
in verse 28. And now little children abide in him. Now, if, you're just, if we were just to jump into this verse right here and try to uh, assimilate this within the, the system or, of man's tradition, it'd be very difficult to understand what he means, abiding in him. But we know what it means to abide in him because we understand the terms of the covenant. The terms of the covenant is where the altar is. Okay? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? and that God re and God now dwells within you in this altar. Okay? It's a very reflection of heaven, because okay? our soul okay, is after His likeness. These tokens is after this pattern, okay? and this fruit according is according to His joy. Okay? This is His joy, His fruit within you. We go on here. So now we're abiding in Him. We're attending the altar, using the tools, change from glory to glory. And as we and as we do these things, we see the face of God. And now the children abide in Him that when He shall appear, this is to reward your endurance of faith. We, what, when He says here, appearing, I'm not talking about as concerning a physical manifestation, even though historically we know that happened, that God came into this dimension into the form of flesh. Okay, born of the Virgin Mary, in the form of flesh. Okay, that's we're not we're, that's not even debatable. Okay, we're not even talking about that. But when he talks about the word appear here, he's talking about the time of visitation. The time of visitation is when God visits you. When God visits you, okay, whatever hour it is that He elects, this is why we're continuing to be alert. Okay, we're keeping our vessels full of faith. We're keeping our 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 our, our, our vases or or our vials there are full of oil. Okay, we're keeping them full of oil so that when, the, when the, the voice is heard, the master comes, the bridegroom comes, we can immediately open to him, whether it be in day or night, whether you be asleep or awake. When the Lord comes to visit you, he sees faith in your heart. You know, that which is common to man, which, ha which has to do is, is abandoning the faith. That's what he's talking about. There is no temptation taken you, Paul says, except that which is common to man. What is common to man has to do with that we that we will use our logic against reason, and we would debate a okay, uh, circumstance with faith. We would debate circumstance with faith. Okay. Only by grace can you overcome or combat okay, this perception. And when God sees that you're combating okay, that which is common to man. And, uh, and favoring that which is in, uh, for God, then you're casting down the imaginations and you're overcoming and you're taking every imagination or every thought into obedience to Christ. Okay? So therefore you will not be ashamed, as he says in verse 2 and verse 28 here, uh, that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him in his coming, that the testimony of our conscience is faith and not sin, that the testimony of your, of your, that our testimony of our conscience is faith and not sin. You will not be ashamed. Because anything that's less than light is shame. Because shame is the name of Satan and his, also, a name is, his name is also sin. Okay, sin is the kingdom. Sin is the fruit. Shame is his name. Okay, because it's less than light. He is darkness. And everything that Satan does is for the purpose of undermining God's plan. When he undermines God's plan, he's putting circumstances as the reality and faith is an abomination. But what we do, by the grace of God, is we exalt faith and abominate the circumstances. Okay? And we can see that this took place when Jesus told Peter to come out of that boat and come to him. Okay? Because the circumstances okay, were dictating one mindset, and Jesus' word was dictating another mindset. When Peter chose the word over the letter, he, uh, the, then he was sustained. But when Peter chose the letter over the word, he was rebuked. Remember when, when that happened? When Peter was rebuked. Okay, this, that's the time okay, that when Jesus was explaining what this plan was. For this purpose I came into the world to die, he says. Okay, and to give my life as a ransom for many. That I'll be, when I go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested and, and Adamites, my own creation, the letters are going to try to humiliate the word. Okay, the letter wants to humiliate the word. The letter wants to make the word look as shame, but the word makes the letter as shame. Okay? You can see the opposite in that. So the letters, okay, uh, by God's permission, okay, uh, took prison, took, took, took the word prisoner 
and smote it, mocked it, spit on it, crucified it. Okay? And of course, they thought at that point in time that the word now being subdued, that the letter itself would have to be accepted of God. But, but the word rose from the dead. Okay? And the word now put all letters to shame. This is what took place here in the bosom of the Father in the very beginning. That which was shall be. That which is shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done. That which took place within the bosom of the Father in the testing. The challenge for the test, not the test itself, the challenge for the test. Iniquity and sin never existed until God created a dimension for it to exist and for it to be nourished. It never existed. The waters didn't exist until he created the waters. And here he created the fires. Here he created the waters. In the bosom of the Father, this is where the word of God was making known to all entities, all souls, okay, all the residences, where he told them, this is the great plan of God. If you want to be as myself, if you want to do well as a God, Okay, and able to express yourself okay, in eternal expressions, in eternal dimensions, okay, without restriction, okay, and uh, and forever your joy to be full. You're going to have to for uh, you're going to have to abandon these desolations, the homes here, which are now desolate, and come to this dimension to be tested. From the bosom to the bosom, the word, the word, the word. Okay, as Paul, as the Apostle John brings out, in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Where it originated, where it was initiated, and now where it was sustained. That's why I put the one word here. These three are one. We live by every word of God. The letter lies. Interesting word there. The letter lies because it works with the record of man. But the Word is truth because it works with the record of God, which is eternal. This whole dimension is going to be consumed by fire. After his purge, God removes, God removes the holy city from here into this dimension and begins a new program okay, whereas we reign as gods with him. That's why it was important for the water and the fire to be united together. Okay, and these portions were put in the blood. And the blood was that which was sanctified, which no man was to drink, but the Son of God himself. And when he said drink of it, he meant that. You drink of this. Okay. Because the, because blood itself is made from the dew, and from the, and from the and from the, also from the sun. From the dew, from the sun is the blood, which we unite these things in the Son of God. Okay, the Son of God be the mediator. We unite these powers together for our redemption. That's why blood was elected to use and uh, for the purpose of showing this uh, this uh, this union. First the wrath, and then the communion was going to be in the blood. That's what he partook of. And when he said, drink you all of it. And when he passed a cup, he says, this is the covenant in my blood, which no man was to drink of the, of the, of the animal because it was a lower kingdom. But now you drink of it because it's the higher kingdom. The Lord God Almighty himself. Okay, drink ye all of it. This is my blood, which could be shed for you. Because I am the word, you are the letter, but being joined to me, you'll be made whole because I am your fullness. And of us fullness have all we received, grace upon grace. That's a power for the transition. Now I'm back here in, in, in the epistle of John. Okay? So at his coming, he rewards our faith. Okay? If he sees faith within your heart, he issues you a power, a dream, a vision, a word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. Okay? Or it also could be uh, 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 it's concerning not only word of knowledge but your charity he gives these things to you so that you uh, uniting together in the assembly would be the word the assembly where two or three are together in my name there in my midst of them my word exists okay, within your letters when you assemble in my name my word exists among your letters when you assemble in my name and there am I in the midst of you uniting you purging you, removing the schism, removing, removing the hostility between you and myself, okay, removing the envy, suppressing the malice, okay, but bringing life, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, your communion. This is your communion. It goes on here. 
Uh, now, if we know that he is righteous, and we know what righteousness is, all right, which has to do with the standard which Jesus is. Okay, my standard is a standard which all things will be measured to and by. Because I created all things for myself and, every, and weight, measure, and rule. Okay, I put all weight, measure, and rule in myself. We see these things, okay, the weight, measure, and rule, as an example, let's say, let's say that the Word of God is a pie. Okay, so Jesus is as a pie. Okay, as a parable, as a pie. Okay. In the first covenant, he took portions of the pie from heavenly things. Okay, he took the sugar and put it into the ark. He took the flour okay, and put it within the, the vestments of the priesthood. Okay, he took also the uh, he took also the uh, the liquid, the water, okay, the ingredients okay, of the water. See, he put that uh, yeah, see within the bath. Okay, he also took. Uh, the fire which is to be heated by, the timing which is going to be uh, consumed in, or you know, and baked in. Okay, the timing and the heat are important, as well as the ingredients itself. He took a portion, and a portion, and a portion of that pie, and he broke it down. That's all he did. The same thing you do in science class. Okay, in science class you take, you take a particular object, and then you put it through okay, a system okay, of, um, okay, of different, uh, using different chemistry, you take it to a system to identify each component or each element okay, that the pie was con uh, consisted of. So God took the pie of the word, put it down to the letter of all the vestments, okay, all the tokens from, the, from the, the, the size of the tabernacle, the dimensions of the tabernacle, the different curtains of the tabernacle, okay, from the skins of the animal, okay, the dyeing of the skins, the, the skins being dyed red, okay, to the vestments, to the construction, of, the construction and the cubits. Okay, everything was by everything was measured away by the shekel, and Jesus is our shekel. Okay, Jesus is the shekel of the sanctuary. Okay, everything was measured and weighed to the shekel, to the cubit, okay, the cubit, and the hand breadth of a man, to the height of a man, okay, which was identifying the man of God, the Son of Man, okay, Jesus Christ. So here we see everything was taken from uh, taken from the pie, put in, broken down into the portions of the letter. And then all the portions of the letter now assembled into the pie again, Jesus Christ. So that when two or three are gathered together, when the letters are gathered together, okay, we are a pie. Okay, we are the whole. Okay, we are as the bread. Okay, we are as the bread there. Okay, that is his righteousness. When we assemble together and when we assemble together as members one of another, see how, see how Paul uses that in chapter 12, okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we are members one of another. So that being members one another, we don't, we don't identify the distinction of ourselves, but we identify the significance okay, of the whole. Okay, the significance of the whole. If we know that he is righteous, that's in verse 29, we know, that we know see the word know there, there's a point of identification and discernment here, because we know how to weigh. We know how to weigh these things. The anointing weighs these things, such as you can discern. Remember the, remember the word tad? which has to do with the truth, T-A-D, truth, anointing, discernment. T-A-D, truth, anointing, discernment. Okay, if, uh, if you have truth, but you don't have the anointing, then there's no discernment. Okay, because people can hear the truth, but they can't discern. We know that because Jesus spoke the truth to the Pharisees, but they can't discern him, they couldn't discern him, could they? Because what was absent? The humbleness, the humbleness of mind for grace. Grace and truth were together, and when grace and truth were together, then the eyes are open. Now you have discernment. Okay? So discernment is absent. Okay? If there's no, if the spirit is absent, and the spirit can't work uh, within you, if the truth is absent. So the truth can only be put within the foundation of the heart by the stewardship. So now you go right back to the terms of the covenant: government, truth, and spirit. So when he says the word righteousness right here, this is in, this is including everything concerning Jesus Christ. Okay, our righteousness. Jesus Christ, our righteousness. We are slaves now to his righteousness, servants to his righteousness, okay, but masters over iniquity. Okay, we rule over iniquity as servants to righteousness. But when we are servants to iniquity, okay, then we can't rule. Can we? We, can't, we cannot rule in that kingdom of righteousness. There's no discernment. There's no bonding. There's no building. There's no fruit. That's what the false religious system is in a state of today. It's in a state of corruption because iniquity is ruling over them. Okay? So instead of ruling over sin, sin is ruling over them. But they're calling sin righteousness and righteousness sin. 
Now we go to verse, uh, chapter 3 again. So when he says the word love, he says, Behold, look at this. Look at this love, which the Apostle John was just describing here. Look at this love, which was absent when you were in ignorance, but is now manifest because of the anointing. The foundation of truth, if it wasn't within you, if, uh, if, if, if truth wasn't laid within the heart, then your perspective would not, uh, would not take on God's perspective. But because truth is laid within the heart, the anointing being active, because you're praying in the tongues, you're praying in the spirit, you're laboring at the altar, you're in a study of doctrine, and you're exchanging a fellowship. We're loving God now as uh, with all of our heart. Remember, heart of faith. With all your soul, the will to serve. With all your mind, the study of doctrine. Okay, and with all your strength, the sacrifices of your charity. We're showing love towards God when we accept one another in fellowship. But when you despise your brother, then you're despising God. Okay, and this is what Jesus said. Okay, if, uh, and, we'll, we, um, and John, of course, expounds on that. If a man say, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar because he's walking by the record of his own soul. He wants the letter of his own brightness to stand for something. He wants the letter of his brightness okay, to, uh, be, to be sanctified by God. And when God would not sanctify Cain's brightness, Cain, the hater of God, smote his brother and murdered his brother. So we're not as Cain, who was that wicked one, who killed his brother. Okay, but we're as Abel, okay, one that, that took delight in the sacrifices of God. Okay, and God visited when God saw the faith of Abel, he visited uh, his sacrifice as a, uh, as a flame of fire, as a man of flame. Okay. Uh, and as fire, he appeared, and sanctifying the sacrifice, uh, Abel took great, uh, took great delight. But Cain, his countenance fell. It was, became darkened because he was leaning to a different council, wasn't he? He was leaning to the council of his own imagination. Okay, and in the hauntiness of his heart, he cast his brother away from the altar of Adam. Okay, and so uh, Abel constructed his own altar, but an altar of faith. Okay, so we see uh, two rivaling brothers. We got the Cain Christians, and we got the Abel Christians. We got the Ishmael Christians, we got the Isaac Christians. We got the Esau Christians, we got the Jacob Christians. We have the false religious system, we have the true religious system. We have the, uh, we have the, the false Jesus, we have the true Jesus. The false Jesus is called Antichrist. The true Jesus, okay, which we embraced, we, we now have his name and likeness called Christ-like, Christian. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So I highlight the word sons of God there. This is a likeness, which I'm talking about right here. From likeness to from likeness. When we get to this stage right here, which I'm pointing at, from glory to glory in our experiences of life, this is a person that's baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now we're going from glory to glory, okay? As as the uh, as the virtue of God is being birthed within the soul, because the state of conscience remains pure. Okay? We live in a very vile environment, and as an example, let's look at Lot as an example. Being uh, being every day bombarded with a filthy conversation of the wicked, he was a man of faith. Because he was a man of faith, upon the day of his visitation, he was delivered. And upon the day of his visitation, when two angels came and visited Lot, it was because he was a man of faith. Okay, by faith, Lot was delivered okay, from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah okay, by, uh, by his faith. And by his faith, he exchanged substance with them. The knowledge at the table, he fed them, he, uh, he housed them, he was protecting them. This is what we do. We protect the word. We feast on the word. Okay, we close the door. Okay, that we close the door as concerning the defilement of the world in order to fellowship okay, with the life of God. Okay, and when we do these things, okay, God delivers us. So even though Lot was beset upon and vexed with a filthy conversation of the wicked daily, yet his faith remained strong. So what happened? He overcame. What do you do? You overcome in the same way. Okay, so we, as an example of Lot, continue to entertain the strangers, don't we? We entertain the strangers because <clears throat> we're strangers in this dimension. And we entertain the strangers with what? With a fellowship of this knowledge. Whereas the brightness blinds the wicked but gives light to the righteous. Okay, so the baptism of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> okay, as we entertain the angels, okay, as we maintain this tether, 
we, uh, we also gained the fellowship. We sup with him, don't we? The fellowshipping of the righteous from glory to glory. It's only as you're fellowshipping the assembly that his name is there. Okay, and by this, okay, we take on this virtue, perspective, healing of the soul. So by his stripes you are healed. When he says the word by your stripes, by his stripes you are healed, he's talking about by the terms of the covenant. Okay, he's birthing in us. Okay, he, uh, the, these powers, this virtue, this perspective. And then from power to power, this is what I put out here. The, the, see these little X's in here. <clears throat> Every one of these X's marks a time of visitation. From power to power. He visits you, a dream, X, visits you with a power, a vision, visits you with a word of knowledge, visits you with a discerning of spirits, visits you with a word of wisdom, he visits you here well, concerning a very a unique manifestation of his power. You can actually feel the, the prayers of the saints. That's a visitation. All Lord Dunas is making known, you're being prayed for at this time. So when you're praying one for another, and we'll be getting something the other on that, Okay, uh, uh, the Apostle John Welty here is going to be putting together okay, a, uh, a, a schedule so that, uh, and the schedule is also going to, uh, is going to interpret time zones so that while you're praying on the other side of the world for us, we can feel your prayers over here. Okay? And we can mark that time there as, as the IPA. You're praying at a particular time. Suddenly you feel a presence. You have a dream or a vision. While I'm praying for the saints in Japan, we see as they're sleeping, I'm praying. As I'm praying, God visits them. God visits with dreams, with visions, and other manifestations, orbs, discerning of spirits, fire, water. One time, I woke up all wet. It wasn't because of a dream, a particular dream, but it was a prayer that was being answered by another saint, which upon synchronizing, going back and synchronizing, we saw that this particular individual was praying at the same time that I was having this manifestation. Okay? And when I woke up all wet, this particular person also had a dream okay, of Jesus coming out of the ocean. Okay? And the government was on his shoulders. It's really incredible what God does. Why would anybody despise prayer? Prayer is a source. Okay? Prayer is a source. Eat of him. Drink of him. Embrace him. Don't let him go. This is what he brings out in the book of Hebrews. They embraced him. They confessed that they're strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay? So this is what we're putting together. Because it brings to your, it brings right to your, right to your uh, understanding. God is alive. God is active, and you are as sons of God here. Sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew Him not. We have many petitions that people bring out on Twitter and Facebook. They said they bring out. It says, "Well, I'm fasting. I'm fasting that uh, <clears throat> that uh, Jesus will be seen by the world. That Jesus will be seen in my life." That's not going to happen. When, when God himself was in this dimension, did people see him? Can you see Jesus with a carnal eye? They're not going to see Jesus with a carnal eye. If they didn't see Jesus, God in the flesh with a carnal eye, why do you think that they're going to suddenly see Jesus in you? They're not going to see Jesus in you. They're just going to, they're going to look at you with the eye of envy, saying, oh, you think you're better than everybody else. That's all they're going to think. They're going to think that you think you're better than everybody else. That's the false Jesus. The true Jesus is concealed. The true Jesus is concealed in the lips of silence, humbleness of mind, endurance of faith, and bearing forth fruit. And like a child being developed in the womb. It's silently taking place, but it's there. Okay, and it's growing day by day. So here, that the world, because the world knows us not, there, uh, because it knew him not. Because the world uh, knows us not, because it knew him not. But the logic, the carnal, the logic of the carnal mind cannot behold the knowledge of God in your face. They can't see it. That's why the false religious system is competing with you. They're competing because they want the letter to stand for the brightness of righteousness. When God says, no, 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 my righteousness is in the brightness of the word. My righteousness is not in the brightness of your letter. The brightness of your letter is only a portion of the rainbow. It's a small part. Okay, But I am as the prism. I'm the one that decides uh, and, and, and brings the vision. I bring the vision and distinction and separation Okay, and identification of each one. This is what Paul was bringing out in 1 Corinthians. Okay, and, uh, but, uh, that, uh, for everything in this, in, in this dimension, every voice in this dimension has a distinction to it. Okay, of course, if you speak Chinese, that means you're from China. If you speak German, that means you're from Germany. Okay, you speak uh, Spanish, that means you're from 
Okay, when you say Latin America or Spain, okay, or whatever language you speak identifies your home. Well, we speak the language of God by faith in Jesus Christ, which identifies our true heritage, our true house, our true destiny. Because our destiny, our origin is our destiny. Beloved, see that in verse 2 here, as you get your sacrifices rather ready. Beloved, okay, that which is close to God's heart. We can see uh, when the word beloved here is defined in the relationship between Jonathan and David. You see, that, that's why uh, the, that the love which David and Jonathan had surpassed that okay, of, uh, okay, of, the, of, of, of the flesh. Okay, surpassed that of the flesh. Okay, uh, and the reason why the Lord he, uh, put the scenario together, but uh, the, you see the relationship of Jonathan and King David okay, before he was king, the relationship that God put there, the bonding that developed there, surpassed that of the love of a woman, the reason why God did that is so that when he, when we read the word beloved now, which you're seeing right here in verse 2, that's the talk of, that's the relationship we're talking about there. Okay, something that's closer than a brother. Okay, something a bonding is that beyond that, okay, of a physical nature. Okay, that which is the fellowship of faith. Okay, way beyond that, okay, which is the, the logic can can't deal with that. Because the logic only can fellowship with a signature. Okay, like signatures, they have a feather flock together. Hey, rabbits fellowship with rabbits, donkeys with donkeys, or mules with mules, horses with horses, and see uh, every species okay, identifies with its own species, with color, with sound, and with location. Okay, but that that's the signature they're identified with. Their fellowship is with signature. Our fellowship is with faith, which removes the boundaries of color, which removes the boundaries boundaries of language, which removes the boundaries of location. It puts us all in one house, the house of God. And we all speak the same thing. This is what Paul was bringing out. Okay? And by the speaking the same thing, we're of one mind and one mouth, we glorify God. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, or 1 Corinthians chapter 1 brings that out in verse 10. Okay, now I beseech you, brethren, by the, uh, by the mercies of God, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but the same mind, the same spirit. That's what we're doing, same mind, the same spirit. The same union, the same bonding, same token, same tools. If we're using the same thing, where, where, where can the strife be? If we're using the same tokens, where's the schism? We're all members one of another. This is what Paul is bringing out. Though your callings might be different, we're all of one community. Because okay? a community is made up of many different skills. Okay? The, man, the man that's a carpenter, he lives over there. The blacksmith, well, he lives over there. Okay? And we have, uh, why the farmer, he lives over there. The magistrate, well, he lives over there. Okay, but all these are of one community. And we can see that it's not because one person is better than the other, but all of them contribute to one community, one mouth. Okay, this, is what, this is what the house of God is. The house of God is made up of government, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and the, the communion of the saints, okay, the community of the saints, okay, which puts us on an equal basis of charity. Okay, but we all have different functions. Okay, as concerning the apostle and the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher. We have different functions. One plows, one sows, one reaps. Okay, one waters. Okay, Apollos watered, okay, as Paul was bringing out. Uh, okay, um, where Paul was bringing these things out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay, uh, I watered and Apollos okay, uh, sowed, okay, but we're all, one, we're, we're all one purpose right here. All one purpose. Of course, I'm paraphrasing that. Now, so he says the word beloved, which I brought out earlier between David and Jonathan. Now, I said, beloved, now are we the sons of God. Okay, through this union, through this exchange, by this one community, this identifies us with this over here. The likeness of God. Okay, it's through this exchange okay, that we're morphing. Okay, we're uniting together. Okay, and God shows us okay, uh, toward, uh, this morphing even within the lowest of the, uh, the animal kingdom. Okay, like that of the amoeba. Okay, the amoeba uh, is like uh, one perzoan. Okay, in science, they remember when you hit, took science class, you saw like under a microscope amoeba. Okay, and then which which is really fascinating is watching it multiply by, from one cell to two cells. Okay, and it would divide apart like that. So there's just one cell. Okay, and then after a moment, the cells would divide, and it become two, but equally together. Mm -hmm, right. 
God put that with an invisible kingdom. You can't see that with the invisible eye, but you can see it with a microscope. So by the knowledge of God, by the Spirit of God, we can see a morphing taking place. God put that symbolism right there, okay, in the amoeba. From lightness to lightness, from glory to glory. See that? So we shall be as gods. And that we, okay, by this lightness over here, enter back to the bosom of our Father by this word being grafted within us, which we mirror and we reflect. Here, we can come back here, like the, like the, like the retina of the eye. Okay, and this is, why, this is why, why I put a picture right here as, as the eye. Because the eye of the Lord is present everywhere. You can't escape the presence of the Lord nor the eye. Because you're right inside of it. How can you escape it? Okay? So uh, we take on, we, by taking on his word, we reflect him right here in this retina. Right? The throne of the Lord. Everything is right here. He sees all things, knows all things. Right here, in the bosom of the Father. Beloved, now are we at this present time because of the anointing called sons of God. And it does not yet appear we shall be, which I was just bringing to your attention. But we know. So I like the word know there. You see, I'm taking my, my highlighter here, my pink highlighter. I like the word know there in verse 2. There's something that's going to be uh, evident and manifested or bearing on the mind, pressed upon the mind. We know. This knowledge being pressed upon the mind gives us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to perceive, doesn't it? It removes okay, the, the veil, it circumcises the understanding so that we begin to see things clearly, okay, not, as, as, not as through a, a, a thick fog, okay, but clearly. Well, that when he shall appear, and this, the word appear again is as uh, what Paul or John brings out in verse 28, coming. Okay, we shall not be ashamed of him as coming. So that when he shall appear and come to reward us, okay, reward in our faith, we shall be like him. So I like the word like. That's what I put here. Like, likeness. We shall be like him. Okay, that is by these powers of his name. We shall be like him. So I like the word like him. For we shall see him as he is. Incredible. There's your discernment again. We shall see him as he is, that by these powers, okay, by these powers and by these gifts which he gives to us, we now have understanding, and now we can see him eye to eye. Okay, we can see him eye to eye. This is where our fellowship is. And Jesus said, I shall no more call you servants, but I've called you my friends. Okay? I have no more call you servants, I've called you friends. Now we sing eye to eye. I'm exchanging with you knowledge that was concealed for ancient, since ancient times. It was concealed. But many wise men, many righteous men, even many prophets desire to hear and to see those things which you now hear and see and have not heard them. They desire these things. These things were concealed, but now it's made manifest to the church. The manifold graces of God is now made known to the church, which has to do with this concealed mystery. It's concealed from the eye, and it's concealed in our hearts. Okay, but we live it day by day. And every man that has this hope in him, there's a word in him again, the hope is by these gifts which he provided for us, in ourselves purifies himself, even as he is pure. Isn't this incredible? The state of the conscience okay, also is reflected in the state of the soul. Okay, that the soul is going through the cycles of growth, from glory to glory. Everything that you learned in that false religious system, everything that you learned in that kingdom of darkness is being, is being removed out of your heart. The weeds are being pulled. What's interesting about weeds, like last, yesterday, a, a John and Melissa there were doing some uh, a, a lawn decor out there, they, uh, fixing up the front of the house there, which looks really nice. And what's interesting, we went out there and uh, we, were, we were looking at you know, the finished product and it looks really nice. Okay, inside of a bush was hidden a weed, and this weed had little thorns on it. What's interesting about that weed is it can conceal itself in there because it looked the same color, but, it, but, but being in there, it was going to uh, ex, uh, extract the strength of the bush, the beauty of the bush that was in there, and it was already diminishing the beauty of the bush. That's the knowledge of this world. The knowledge of this world diminishes the beauty of God's truth, and the thorns of it okay, has to do with the, you know, the pain Okay, that, that that false knowledge does. Because false knowledge cannot work with faith. Faith cannot work with false knowledge. Okay, and it's thorny. Okay. And the word thorny also has to do with that uh, the weed itself okay, uh, pricks with envy. 
It pricks with doubt. It pricks with bitterness. It pricks with malice. It pricks with malignity. Okay, being a state of a state of bad attitude, doesn't it? Okay, it pricks with these things, but it wants to say that it's a Christian, because the colors of the leaves look the same, but the roots and the sources, okay, the roots are different. Okay, the roots are different. The plant has two different purposes to it: the bush for the equity of the eye, but the weed is despised. But the weed, being the hypocrite, okay, it wants to maintain the brightness of the bush that it's inside of. So the apostle John bent over. He says, you come out of there. And he took it, plucked it right out. And that's what we do with the knowledge of God. We plucked the air out of the heart okay, with, okay, with the, the fingers of truth. We pluck it right out. And now the, now the, now the, the bush itself has now maintained the integrity okay, of what was designed for as the knowledge of God. It maintains the integrity okay, that was given to us by the hand of God. Every man that has his hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The state of the conscience is now mirrored in, in the state of the soul, okay, so that you're pure. And this is what Jesus said at the very beginning. Blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. If faith is within your heart, then you can behold the face of God and the knowledge of each other. But if your heart is not pure, if the conscience is defiled, then with suspicion you approach the things of God. With suspicion, with caution, okay, with doubt, okay, and of course, uh, when you approach these things with doubt, you, you become double-minded upon the tidings of them. Doubt and double-mindedness. Doubt is the, is the daughter of Satan. Okay? Doubt is the daughter of Satan. Okay? And it fellowships with those okay, which okay, uh, okay, walk in ignorance. It fellowship with those of ignorance. They hear the word, but then doubt wants to join yourself. Doubt wants to fellowship with you. Okay? And when doubt fellowships with you, it talks about all the scenarios, the circumstances. It wants to bring before your mind, you can't escape from Pharaoh because you got an ocean in front of you. you got the Red Sea in front of you. You can't escape the spear of Pharaoh. He's more powerful than you are. And then, this, and then doubt says again to the minds of the people, you, you are dead because Pharaoh's going to come and revenge. Okay? And so doubt is creating, a, a, is creating an image in your mind to where every, the, the larger the image the smaller the faith. Okay, and before you know it, faith is just a little peep over there. You know, and we, of course, we don't really listen to little peeps, do we? When God, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, it thundered and quaked, and the hearts of the people did the same thing. Okay, as concerning it quaked and it shook. Okay, and with fear. Okay, that's, that's, that's the way your faith is. When your faith is feasting upon the power of God, it shakes the kingdoms of darkness. Okay? But when doubt, the clouds of doubt come in and start telling you the circumstances over here. Oh, how can you be of God? No one believes the way you believe. See, doubt. Immediately your faith begins to shrink. Shrink smaller and smaller and smaller. And says, no, this isn't cool, is it? Okay, we, don't, we don't like that. Because the fellowship, even when faith gets smaller, your fellowship also gets smaller. Before you know it, you're not even attending assemblies anymore. Because the circumstances over here are your truth. The false knowledge which the fallen watchers gave to the, that, the people that first millennium, self-sufficiency becomes your fear rather than the fear of the Lord. When self-sufficiency becomes your fear, you labor under the shadows of that doubt, of that kingdom. So you always look at things from worst case scenario. The what if, the what if this, the what if that, what if that happens, what if this happens. Well, I can see you've been fellowshipping with Satan's daughter for a while, haven't you? And you, what you need to do is you need to lock that door, to close that window to Satan's daughter, because she is on the streets of every corner, calling to you. Says, "Come and drink of my water, and eat of my meal, because my because uh, my 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 water is my water is bitter." Okay, and then she actually her she says, "My sweet water is bitter." Okay, and if you go and fellowship with her, you better realize that when she who she fellowship with. Her guests are the depths of hell, okay, as we see in the book of Proverbs. Got one minute left here. Her guests are the depths of hell. But whoso hearkens unto my wisdom, the Spirit says, okay, you shall escape from her. You will not fellowship with doubt nor with her friends. Okay, her friends okay, will only fellowship with those things which of the passion, okay, which is earthly, sensual, devilish. It destroys it steals faith. It destroys your confidence. 
It will rob you of your salvation. And then in the very end, you'll weep and wail. Say, oh, how I've hated my instructors. My, my instructors. How I despise this knowledge. But now I wish I would have listened. Okay? Those that have ears to hear disgrace. Okay, will build with disgrace. Your faith will become as a roaring lion, as the voice of the Lord when he roared on Mount Sinai, which, which caused the kingdoms of the caverns of darkness to quake. We are pulling down kingdoms right now. Okay, the kingdoms which we're doing, we're pulling down the 13 kingdoms of Satan's, uh, Satan's seat, the thrones of the, of, the, of the 13 princes. We're pulling those down. They're very much aware of you. Okay, they know you. Just like they, just like they testified uh, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? You remember the seven sons of Sceva. But who are you? They took the name of God unto themselves. Okay? And they could not overcome that kingdom of darkness. The old kingdom of darkness overcame them. So whosoever takes the name of God in vain okay, will perish okay, under that kingdom of darkness. All right, at this time, I'm going to get the, uh, the mic over to uh, teacher Adina. And she's going to be reading your sacrifices at the completion of them. Then I will be closing.